mysterious structure. What is this? Work continues after the static fire of Booster 11. More testing soon? Ship 29 loses even more heat tiles. The Delta IV Heavy finally launches and Starlink captures the solar eclipse. My name is TJ. Welcome to What About It. Let's dive right in. Starship updates. Another busy week at Starbase. Today we have some new developments about Flight 4 of Starship, as well as a flyover revealing some fascinating things. Eager to know more? Follow me. Even though there are no prototypes currently undergoing testing at the launch site, the area is full of life as usual. Following the recent 33-engine static fire test, SpaceX's teams instantly got back to work. The orbital launch table is once again covered in scaffolding, with various components on the deck itself, both large and small, in the process of being dismantled. Some of these parts will need replacing, while others might be in good enough condition to be reused. What's cool is that it seems SpaceX is growing more confident in the rapid reusability aspect of the whole structure. It wasn't until after the static fire was completed that we realized that this was the first time SpaceX didn't repaint the orbital launch mount's legs before reigniting the engines. Currently, the table may appear a bit worn and rusted, but we're confident it will be touched up with a new layer of paint in time for the next launch. We're also witnessing significant activity at the heart of the gateway to Mars, the orbital tank farm. Workers are busy connecting the new horizontal tanks, also known as the hot dog tank. Some of them have even already shown signs of venting. This should mean that we might see this system fully operational by the time of the fourth or fifth flight. It does, however, seem that our days of peeking at the piping are numbered. Our second Starbase photographer, Astro Rody, caught workers installing what looks to be containment wall panels in front of the new tank farm. So, sadly, no more tank watching for us. I'm sad, I like my tanks. Before Flight 3, two small tanks were installed close to the road, speculated to store liquid nitrogen. Adjacent to these, workers have set up three massive vaporizers. A vaporizer is a relatively straightforward device that converts cryogenic fluid into gas. It channels the fluid through an elongated tube equipped with fins. As the liquid interacts with the external heat, it transforms into gas. Pretty cool, huh? This gas is then used to pressurize the propellant tanks, filling the void left as propellant is drawn from them. Without such a system, the tanks could implode during Starship tanking. Keep the floating away. I like to not be ploting. In the original vertical tank farm, SpaceX used water-based heat exchangers for this process. However, the shift towards using vaporizers eliminates the need for water, thereby rendering the large water tank useless. With all this progress, what are your thoughts? Do you anticipate the new tank farm will come into play by Flight 4, or might we be in a longer wait? Place your bets in the comments below. Now, by taking to the skies, possible thanks to Redline helicopter tours, we can see a lot of progress on the second orbital launch tower. At the time of these aerial photos that were captured by John Cargyle, the work involved the wick drain stitchers, which was nearing completion. However, as you see, some wicks appear to have vanished. Were they taken out? No. Once installed, the wicks remain permanently in place. Instead, now excavators are adding huge amounts of soil on top. This generates pressure, effectively compacting the ground and expelling water through the wicks, similar to squeezing out a wet sponge. This ground consolidation phase may span several months, though some light work can begin sooner. With any luck, we'll begin to see the first signs of the new tank farm really soon. It really is amazing to see what you can discover just by looking at things from the sky. Did you know that you can take a helicopter ride over Starbase and get the same kind of views that you see in our videos? Visit redlineheli.com slash Felix to book your very own helicopter ride over Starbase with $25 off. You'll never forget this. Now, moving to the production site, this is where our two prototypes of the fourth flight of Starship are currently stored. Ship 29, housed in the high bay, is the first one that has a chance of surviving re-entry, according to Elon at least. From what we've seen, the SpaceX team is taking that challenge really seriously. The heat tiles on this ship prototype are undergoing extensive replacement. The workers nearly completed one side of Ship 29's nose cone, and at first glance, the new tiles look exactly like the old ones. Yay! Now, they are the same shape and arranged in the same pattern, suggesting that the significant changes might lie within the tile composition or adhesive used to attach them. Further down, some of the previously missing tiles have been replaced, while others have been removed entirely. A particularly interesting section can be found just a few 
few meters below the PEZ door. With the tiles stripped away, the blue adhesive used in areas where mounting pins aren't an option is clearly visible. It's worth noting that in certain areas, like the nose cone, the adhesive is red, where in other sections, like on the flaps, it's blue. Unfortunately, we don't know why that's the case, but blue is my favorite color. Meanwhile, Super Heavy Booster 11 is inside the Mega Bay, undergoing modifications before its first and only launch. From the bird's eye view, we can spot a hot staging ring behind the high bay, likely intended for this prototype. While one team is prepping the prototypes for the fourth flight, Another group is already laying the groundwork for flight number five. In the last episode, Felix mentioned that Ship 30 was moved from the high bay straight to the center work stand in Mega Bay 2. Upon its arrival, SpaceX engineers wasted no time getting the prototype ready for engine installation. On April 8th, in remarkably quick operation spanning in less than 24 hours, Ship 30 was outfitted with all six of its Raptor engines. <laughs> Dude, that's quick. While there's still a bit of work ahead before its test campaign kicks off again, if the progress of the past prototypes is any indication, we should expect Ship 30's engines to roar to life in less than a month from now. Now, Mega Bay 2, as you might be aware, houses three such workstands, leading us to the Sanchez site. Here, you'll find these weird window-like panels scattered on the ground. They are integral to the workstand, enabling SpaceX to simulate a clean room environment within the second megabit. This setup is critical for keeping debris from the prototypes during sensitive operations such as engine installation. Adjacent to these panels is an unidentified platform, the purpose of which remains somewhat a mystery, along with two additional Raptor installation platforms. These will be added to the workstand, allowing the lifting and easy installation of Raptor engines by the workers. At the site's edge, near the entrance, two black structures are unmistakably the new booster transport stands. The one on the left, which had been idle for some time, has now received all 20 of its clamps and seems almost ready to be used. Workers are slowly assembling a second such stand to the right, though it appears it will be a few weeks, if not months, before its completion. While SpaceX may not currently have a pressing need for an abundance of stands, the anticipated ramp up in production will require having lots of them as prototypes will be moved around constantly. Lastly, let's check out one of the coolest spots near Boca Chica, the Massey's test site. This location is always abuzz with activity. As SpaceX is working on the second tower, the need to relocate ship engine testing has brought us here. At the rear of the test site is where you'll find the flame trench, almost ready for flame deflector installation which allows for safer engine testing. Since our last flyover, the trench has significantly deepened thanks to the work of three excavators tirelessly scooping out soil. Judging by the shadow, it's evident that soil has also been removed from beneath this huge concrete slab. While it may yet not have reached its final depth, our next flyover should verify that for us. The trench has also received proper safety railings and what seems to be a ramp. It will likely be used to allow the SPM transporter to move the testing stand. Additionally, the surrounding area has been paved to keep dust at bay. Closer to the front, we now observe many components that likely belong to the flame deflector itself. These thick metal pieces are expected to form the trench's sidewall. Meanwhile, metal pipes on the site will also serve as the core of the deflector. Yet, there's a twist. At first, we thought that the trench would consist of two segments. However, during our flyover, a truck was in the process of making a delivery to Massey's, unloading a third, shorter section. So in the end, it looks like the deflector will be assembled from three parts. Another thing worth taking a look at is the ship test stand itself. Now it boasts all four of its spider legs along with two cross beams added to reinforce the structure. These additions, once again, suggest that the possibility of transporting the stand via an SPM transporter. It'll be interesting to see how this all comes together. Progressing towards the front of Massey's reveals another intriguing development. A mysterious new structure has emerged. While there were once massive embeds, we now observe a leg-like framework. The adjacent pieces hint at a ring-like structure, yet the stand's ultimate function remains a puzzle. Some people suggested that this could be the V2 can crusher. However, it looks a bit too heavy duty and it also introduces a few issues. For instance, all previous test stands at Massey's were designed with mobility in mind, and currently the site lacks a crane capable of hoisting a booster to such heights. So what are your thoughts on the purpose of this new addition to Massey's? Is it just a more heavy duty version of a can crusher or could we be looking at something entirely different? Share your theories in the comments. Oh, and heads up, we've looked into our channel metrics and over 2 million returning monthly viewers have not subscribed yet. 
Help us grow the channel further by double checking that you've hit that subscribe button so you don't miss our updates. And even sometimes my dog, Ranger. Hi, buddy. Go lay down. Good boy. And while you're at it, give us a like and become a Y supporter for exclusive SpaceX updates. With it, you get access to daily Starbase photo galleries, including satellite, aerial, and ground photos of SpaceX's progress and countless other extras on top. And no matter how much you decide to give, everyone gets the same supporter content and access. And for all of you who watched IFT with us or somewhere else, I have something very special our IFT3 commemorative shirt. If you loved IFT3, this is something you wanna have. The shirt is tagged in the video and in our description. The link to our Patreon page and our new website is also in the description. Thank you to our supporters who help us fund more of these crazy projects. We cannot thank you enough. You rock. Now, before we go back to the news, here's a quick word about some really cool earbuds from our sponsor, Raycon. And oh, uh, by the way, when I recorded this originally, uh, the transition's a little off here, so you'll see. Thanks, Felix. Oh, sorry, forgot I had these in. As a tinnitus sufferer, I rely on Raycon earbuds for focusing on work. The sleek design ensures comfort and great audio quality for an immersive experience. With Mother's Day approaching, they are the perfect gift. All moms I know deserve a break, so treat them. They're good, they're fun, I like them. Not just saying it. With Raycon's noise isolation, moms can enjoy music amid daily chaos while awareness mode keeps them connected to their surroundings. Mm, mm, mm. Oh, yes. I bet my mom would love to use these for travel. Click the link in the description box or go to buyraycon.com slash whataboutit to get 20% off your Raycon purchase, plus free shipping. Give your mom peace of mind this Mother's Day with the gifts she'll love at a price you'll love. Raycons come with five pairs of silicone tips for the perfect in-ear fit and a charging case with 32 hours of battery life. Click below or go to buyraycon.com slash whataboutit for 20% off with free shipping. Okay, no more kisses then from Ranger. By the way, that one mom, she was pretty cute. The end of an era is here after a slight delay. A few episodes back, we dug into the rich history of Delta Rockets, a launcher family that began in the 1960s. Now through the decades, the Delta evolved, accumulating into the Delta IV, which interestingly bore little resemblance to its original. While we've explored its origins and capabilities, we've not yet addressed the why. Why would United Launch Alliance decide to retire a rocket that has reliably met customer demands and stands as one of the most reliable rockets ever created? The answer, money. Before SpaceX entered the market, the Delta IV Heavy virtually monopolized the market for launching heavy spy satellites for the National Reconnaissance Office. Reportedly, one Delta IV Heavy launch cost was ranging anywhere from three to $400 million, with only the last three missions dipping below the 300 million mark. However, given the lack of alternatives, the US government was forced to bear these costs, continuing to support ULA. But then, SpaceX entered the game. They not only introduced a rocket like the Falcon Heavy, capable of lifting more mass to orbit, but did so at a significantly lower cost. Faced with this market change, ULA decided to phase out both the Atlas V and Delta IV, pivoting to the brand new Vulcan Centaur. This next-gen rocket not only benefits from new cost-saving manufacturing technology, but also may one day become partially reusable through the smart system. But one final Delta IV Heavy rocket remained, tasked with closing out this chapter in spaceflight history. And what could be more fitting than concluding with one last mission for the National Reconnaissance Office? True to form, the details of the mission will forever be a secret, but it's widely believed that packed within the fairing was the Advanced Orion satellite. Rumored to be among the largest satellite ever constructed, the primary antenna of this behemoth reportedly spans over 100 meters or 300 feet in diameter. Wait, that's like a football. Ranger, is that like a football field? That's like a football field. That's huge. It's a surveillance satellite, but it's unclear what types of signals it captures. What was funny was that the last Delta clearly didn't want to leave Cape Canaveral though. Initially scheduled for March 28th, the launch was abruptly halted for four minutes before ignition due to an issue with a nitrogen pump. Interestingly, the issue wasn't related to the Slick 37 launch pad, but stemmed from NASA's own infrastructure responsible for liquid distribution to the pads. Following the necessary repairs, a new launch date was announced for April 9th. This time, the countdown proceeded as planned, culminating in the Delta IV Heavy setting itself on fire for one last time and taking to the skies. Six, five, we have ignition. Two, one. 
and lift off of the final United Launch Alliance Delta IV Heavy Rocket. That's heavy metal, baby. Heavy metal. After a perfect liftoff, we saw a successful jettison of the side boosters and correct second stage ignition. Given the classified nature of the mission, this is where the live stream concluded. However, ULA later confirmed that everything went as planned with successful satellite separation. And so we bid adieu to the Delta IV Heavy. Some people may feel sad about it retiring. I know I do. But newer and better rockets will replace it. The baton is being passed to the companies following the new space ideology, and among these pioneers is one of our favorites, Stoke Space. Currently, they are working on their first rocket, Nova, which is set to be 100% reusable from its very inception. Last year, Spoke was intensively testing the upper stage of their rocket, culminating in an impressive hop test controlled by 15 thrust chambers attached to a singular rocket engine. Although new second stage prototypes haven't been created since that milestone, the next development phase has definitely begun. At the end of February, the company showcased their new second stage thrust chamber ring now featuring not 15, but 30 nozzles. Simultaneously, work on the Nova's first stage has begun accelerating as well. The first prototype tank underwent pressure testing in December, and by January, Stoke revealed progress regarding their first stage engine. The rocket will use seven Methalox full float stage combustion engines, which is the same type of engine as SpaceX's Raptor. As you probably know, because you're watching this channel, making a full flow stage engine is very hard. In fact, Raptor is the only one that has been used in flight so far, but it does look like the gang at Stoke Space may be able to pull it off. In January, the company shared footage of the fuel pre-burner tests. This was followed in February with pictures of the oxygen pre-burner and turbo pump test articles. After a brief period of quiet, they surprised everyone in April by sharing a complete engine installed on their test stand. This is some SpaceX level progress. While some final checkouts are pending, it's expected that we'll witness this engine's first firing in the not so distant future. The pace at which Stoke Space is advancing is nothing short of remarkable. And I can't wait to see the first stage hop test. We may even see it this year, fingers crossed. And lastly, while our focus of this channel isn't primarily on astronomy, it's difficult to overlook this year's total solar eclipse. And good news, I only burned my retinas a little bit this time. I'm kidding, I didn't burn them. Such an event occurs when the moon itself finds itself between the Earth and the sun, casting its shadow across certain regions of our planet. Solar eclipses come in at a few varieties, starting with the partial eclipse, where only a section of the sun is obscured by the moon. Next, we have the annular eclipse, which occurs when the Earth, moon, and sun align perfectly, but with the moon at its furthest point from the Earth. This alignment creates a beautiful ring of light around the moon. Then there's the total solar eclipse, a phenomena where the moon is at just the right distance from Earth to completely cover the sun. During such moments, daytime briefly transitions to darkness and the sun's corona or outer atmosphere becomes visible. On average, a total solar eclipse occurs every 18 months at different parts of the planet. However, given the vastness of Earth's oceans and polar regions, an opportunity to see one is extremely rare. The most recent total solar eclipse occurred on April 8th and was visible across parts of Mexico, the United States, and Canada. What captured our attention was the view from space. In an unexpected twist, SpaceX released footage of the moon's shadow captured by one of their engineering cameras on board a Starlink satellite. Yes, Starlink satellites are equipped with cameras. That's a fact not many know about. Additionally, views of the eclipse were provided by SEN, NOAA, and of course, the International Space Station. For those in the US who missed this spectacle, there's no need to worry. The next total solar eclipse visible from the US will occur in 2044. So there's plenty of time to plan out a trip and see it with your own eyes. And that's it for today. Remember to hit that like button to subscribe for more great content from us. And if you wanna train your space IQ even further, watch this next video to continue your journey. Thank you so much for watching and we'll see you in the next video. This ground consol consolidation, consolidation. Consolidation phase. Turbo pump, why can't I say that word? Stop licking the ball, stop licking the ball. Man. Consolidation?